Hello, I'm V.B. Price. I'm the editor of NewMexicoMercury.com. We're here today on Insight New Mexico with gubernatorial candidate Gary King, a lifelong New Mexico uh, resident attorney general uh, of our state, served a dozen years in the New Mexico uh, State House of Representatives, ran against uh, Steve Pierce in Congressional District 2 in 2004 and lost unhappily. He was elected attorney general in 2006 and has was re-elected in two, 2010. He holds a Ph.D. in organic chemistry uh, and has served as an environmental policy advisor to, to uh, the DOE. Uh, last week, or two weeks ago, I guess, uh, a Republican poll, the Rasmussen poll, had him tied with the governor. Uh, a rather dramatic swing from being 16 by one poll to six down by another poll, and now he's tied by this poll. Uh, so it's wonderful to have you with us today, and uh, we've got lots of things to talk about. Well, thank you. Yeah, it's, it's really nice to be here, and uh, uh, as, as we were talking just a little bit earlier, it, it's, uh, I'm glad I survived uh, the first round in order to be here for the second round. Um, I, I appreciate you know, those, those people that supported me in the primary, and uh, part of the good news of this campaign is that all of my uh, colleagues who ran in the primary have have supported me and endorsed me in the in the general election and uh, I really appreciate uh, what they've done I, and and uh, I think they're all actually helping with the campaign organization I, uh, uh, Senator Lopez is is heading up the uh, women for Gary King organization and uh, Alan Weber has been very helpful in, in helping us to set up events and uh, in Santa Fe and in northern New Mexico, and uh, Howie Morales, particularly uh, w one of our big issues is education, and of course Senator Morales was very important in that education debate, and, and he's been very helpful, and, and Lawrence Rael has been um, sending notes out and, and, and encouraging his folks to, uh, to volunteer and to help us, and so, uh, you know, I think that, that all Democrats recognize that, that this is uh, really, such an important race for the state of New Mexico um, that you know that that it's that four more years of the same policies that we've had for the last four years will be very devastating to New Mexico families, and so we're all working together, and I think that that's a, a wonderful opportunity. Well, I'm glad you survived the primary too, and I'm glad you survived all these road trips you've been taking all over the state to Gallup, to Hobbs, to all over the place. You're on the road a lot. Um, we um, we have uh, this is such a curious. Thing. And you're absolutely right. Such a powerfully important election. Um, we kind of uh, have in the back of our minds, though. I think Democrats are worried about voter suppression. Are worried about you know particularly the Republican move over many many decades to you know to quell our voters, basically. Uh, and they're also worried about this huge war chest that uh, that the governor apparently has, and are wondering about if you can raise the $2 million or so, or have it already, that you know, that we might need to win this thing. I don't really know how much it takes anymore, uh, but I'd love to hear your views on that a little bit. Well, well fortunately for me, um, uh, people vote and money does not. <laughs> so, uh, But you're right about um, you know our concerns about voter suppression. I actually uh, am currently locked in combat with the Secretary of State because cause she has changed um, the she's changed the the rules in the middle of the game basically for me by claiming that that I'm not allowed to raise money uh, to pay off campaign debt from the primary election uh, when when the guidance that was issued by the Secretary of State clearly uh, had rules for how you do that and such and so um, you know I, I think that if she's willing to do that and change the rules in the middle of the game uh, that that we have to be concerned about the election process overall I mean uh, and so. Uh, but there, the way to get around that is to make sure that that our people are are very enthusiastic about going and voting. Um, so so we have been working hard to make sure that people recognize how important this election is, that they get registered to vote now, um, that they uh, that they get not only themselves and their families out to vote, but their friends and neighbors. I I, I was at a, a speech recently that. Uh, 
uh, Dolores Huerta gave where she was talking about uh, the fact that Meg Whitman spent $140 million in California in the governor's race and Jerry Brown spent $35 million. Uh, I mean, both of those numbers are huge compared to New Mexico numbers, <laughs> but, but about a five-to-one money advantage and that Jerry Brown won the election because of the organization of, of the people that supported Jerry Brown, the party, and, and, and lots of those other things. And so she said, you know, you can't just vote this year in this election and think that you're you're doing your duty. You got to put on your sneakers and you got to get out on the street and you got to go talk to your neighbors and such. So, um, you know, I, I think that by and large in New Mexico that we have had honest elections. And so, you know, I, I don't want people to feel like um, their vote doesn't count or, or that what they're doing won't make a difference because th this could be the kind of election where one vote per precinct might make all the difference in the world because we have, I'm, I'm sure, I actually don't know the total number, but say a thousand or two thousand precincts, this could very well be an election where, where two thousand votes makes all the difference in the election. So, oh, so it. important for people to be uh, energized and enthusiastic about getting out and working to vote. And, and so, we'll, I am confident that we will raise the money resources that we need to to get our message out. Um, I, I am concerned uh, that, that the governor seems to have so much money, uh, most of which she raised out of state in you know, Texas and Wyoming and Arizona and Colorado. I, you know, I can name all of the places where she's been for raising money. But you know, those are people uh, who we don't know whether they have New Mexico's best interest at heart. Uh, you know, we, we know that the people that are working on our campaign have New Mexico's interest at heart. And um, and so you know we're going to overcome that, but but man, they you know they have a lot of money to spend and they're using it, uh, it you know to. To, to do character assassination, I, you know, I hope that people will understand that. But I, you know, the the most recent ad says that I voted three times to increase my pay in the legislature, hoping that people in New Mexico don't recognize that we're all volunteers in the legislature. I mean, the whole, <laughs> there's, the, no pay. there's no pay. <laughs> you know, the whole time I was there, um, you know, that we we don't get a salary. Uh, they actually criticized me for saying that legislators should get a salary, but. Um, you know, people, you know, I gave up two months worth of, of my work in my law office every year in order to uh, serve the people of the state of New Mexico. And I, I could do that. Uh, a lot of people can't. If we really want to have a legislature that represents all the diverse issues in New Mexico, uh, you know, I, th I think that we should do various things that encourage more people to, to get involved in the process. So, so I, I think that it's sort of an indication of, of how little the governor understands the process to, to actually claim that I voted to increase my pay. Um, we, we have per diem, and the per diem is set in the Constitution, and we can put it on the ballot, but the people in New Mexico vote for the, cons for the per diem changes. Um, and so, so it's just it's just misleading. It's you know it's using a lot of money to mislead the voters, and that's not what we need in New Mexico. We need to have a real debate on the issues in New Mexico, which are, uh, as you know, I mean, w what's happening to our education system, what's happening to our children, youth, and family department, what what's happening to our water, what's happening to uh, our working people who you know who. You know, we, we're the worst state in the country with regard to uh, job creation, and, and, and the governor has no plan for how we're going to address all of those situations, and so therefore she's just reduced to character assassination. I think that that's sad. So a while back we, we learned to our dismay that the National Democratic Governors Association wrote, wrote you off, uh, wrote New Mexico off, and wouldn't put any of its considerable millions into our campaign. Has anything changed on that, on that score? Has, has the Rasmussen poll unlocked any, any dollars, or are we still waiting on those, on those guys? Well, the um, uh, you're right about this. The statement that was made uh, before the primary election, as a matter of fact, I think it was Governor Schumlin, who's with the Democratic Governor Association, who who went down a list of states that they had written off, mostly in the West. So one, I thought that that just indicated that they don't understand the West. They certainly don't understand New Mexico, and um, and and so for me, this election has always needed to be a local election. I mean, I, you know, people in New Mexico know what the issues are, yeah. and so so we're focusing on those local issues. So so it, it wasn't something that I was horribly dependent on. But I will say uh, that a lot of eyes were opened when Rasmussen, as you said, which normally leans kind of Republican, um, came out with, with numbers that said that this race was a dead heat. We actually had previously done a poll, a good quality poll, that, that showed essentially the same results. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so we're confident that this race is a dead heat. And so that has certainly caused um, people in, in, around the country to, to sit down and take a look. 
And, and so I believe that, you know, as that we move through this and people see that those are, are valid numbers, um, that, uh, that indeed that the DGA will help. They, they issued a statement right after the primary that said, we know Gary King, we know he's a solid Democratic candidate. Um, you know, we, we want you all to take a look at him. And, and they sent that out to their, um, to their group. And so, um, interesting enough, under our campaign finance laws, now the, you know, even the DGA would not be able to directly give me more right. than about $10,000. Um, I think that a lot of people look to see what they're doing, and so you know there may be other donors that are kind of waiting to see whether they weigh in or not. Um, Particular, I think you know there's a lot of uh, organized labor. The you know the national um, uh, we've had good support from Teamsters, uh, food and commercial workers. I mean th those are our groups that supported me early. Now we certainly have support from uh, most organizations that represent working people, uh, but but they of course have their. Uh, folks in in Washington D.C. or or in other places, they're international organizations. So there's a lot of discussion going out there now. I think that people are looking at New Mexico and saying, "Hey, you know, here here's a chance for us to win a race that we weren't expecting to win, but but I co of course have always expected to win. I I wouldn't get in the race if I didn't think that there was a pathway to winning." Yeah. Education Secretary Skinner had a uh, op-ed in the uh, in the journal a while back that said. Uh, She's putting New Mexico children first, and of course, New Mexico children are last. And I'm wondering how long she can put New Mexico, New Mexico children first, and have them be last. It doesn't seem like a very effective scheme that she's that she's managed to come up with. Uh, also, very interested in her relationships to out-of-state education corporations like Pearson, the massive international test maker and publisher Penguin, and other people. Um, there seems to be something really fishy here, and many New Mexicans, local people like us, understand that this is a terrible move, I think, to grab money from a state that has none and to exploit people who are in a desperate place. Um, I'll stop preaching, but, but uh, what, uh, what, uh, what's your solution to this, and how do you undo, once you get into office, how do you undo what's already been done? Well, to answer your last question first, uh, that is, um, you know, it's one of the reasons I'm running for governor is is that I have uh, so much experience in state government that that I believe, uh, just as a, as a top line statement, and then we'll get into yeah. the specifics that that I believe that that I do have the skill set that it takes to fix a lot of the things that are broken. Um, I think I can work with the legislature. I was in the legislature 12 years. There's still some of my colleagues that are left there. A lot of, a lot of new, really bright, uh, young legislators who are, who are there. And so there's a lot of opportunity. There's a lot of talent there. And of course, the current governor refuses to work with the legislature essentially, and so that that causes some of the problems, particularly with regard to education, because you have to listen to, you have to listen to educators, you have to listen to the legislature, you have to listen to school administrators, none, none of whom have any. Uh, standing to speak with the governor right now, as close as I can tell. Uh, and you're right, it's all Hannah Scandera. And, and Hannah Scandera, we don't know where she gets her marching orders from exactly, but, but we know where she came from and, and, you know, the background that she came from. Um, educators are very concerned about the fact that, that we just have never in the last four years had a, a secretary who even met the constitutional requirements for being the, the education secretary. So one of the things that we're promising in, in our campaign is that is that the new secretary of education will be someone who has teaching credentials and experience and, and experience in New Mexico with the New Mexico system because we are not necessarily like everybody else in the world. And, and uh, so that, that goes really to the depth of the question that you're asking. Um, as I as I talk to people, one one of the things that everybody really understands, I think, is that we are losing uh, our best teachers at an unprecedented rate. Uh, you know, the retirements in in the Albuquerque uh, public school system uh, are uh, thirty or forty percent higher than they have been in a normal year. Um, you know, that's an indication of a problem. Uh, as I talk to parents, they say, you know, my children don't want to go to school anymore, and and this is, you know, it starts almost in kindergarten now because there is this this press. To, to do standardized testing at all costs. It doesn't matter what the impact on children is. It doesn't matter what the impact on our schools is. It doesn't matter what the impact on our teachers is. And, and the only thing I can surmise is indeed, as you said, there are companies that are making um, large amounts of money, tens of millions of dollars that the state of New Mexico is paying right now to uh, out-of-state corporations, uh, Pearson being one of them, to, to generate these 
um, standardized exams. Um, I, I've certainly have had uh, educators talk to me about the new test here in Albuquerque they call the Dibbles test, which is a test for third grade readers, uh, and, and that that test is directly tied to a to a corporation that's owned by Rupert Murdoch and, um, and, and, and designed by a foundation that's led by Jeb Bush. And, and of course, Hannah Scandera coming out of Florida has very close connections with Jeb Bush. And so I think that there's a lot of concern about why suddenly the pressure to change the exam there because we have several years worth of exam data for third graders and, and the governor says that you know third grade reading is the, is the holy grail. Uh, and and it doesn't make any sense to change to a new testing methodology that doesn't compare to the old testing methodology and then believe that you can that you can make any determinations about whether we're getting better or not. Um, I also saw that there was a, a headline in the paper recently that said that we aren't doing better, that, that test scores are down. And so, you know, all of, all of those things that we can measure, and I am a scientist, but, uh, you know, if, if you want to measure... Um, teachers who are retiring, if you want to measure how we're doing in our test scores, if you want to measure, uh, you know, virtually anything that relates to uh, quality in our schools, it, it's all gone down. And, and a lot of that is because there's, there is no respect being paid to professional educators. They're, they're not being involved in, in the discussion about what's best for our children. And uh, it's very frustrating. I, I was just in uh, southeastern New Mexico and found that there are a lot of teachers that are retiring out of the system in the southeastern corner of the state and going to work for oil and gas companies because because they're just able to to make more money and feel like they're doing something more useful and and it just it's so sad to see all of that talent and all those people who have the kind of heart that really you know they they want to teach kids I talked to a young woman um, yesterday I said hang in there at least until the election and see what the election results are before you leave the school system yeah. uh, because clearly she she loved teaching and so that's uh, so there's you know there's the dollar question there's the question of excellence in our schools but there's also this question about respect for the system because we don't have respect for teachers and administrators and local school boards and all of those folks who feel like they understand yeah you know, what's best for their children. And, and parents, you know, I have a lot of parents coming and talking to me, and they, they're, not, they're not happy with the system either. So it's, it's very, very discouraging. It's one of those things where I say we have to make a change in this election because if we don't, we're going to continue down that path of corporatization of our schools. And in New Mexico, it will take many, many years to recover if we, if we go to a system that, uh, you know, that just crushes the enthusiasm of students when they're young. Um, that doesn't focus on innovation and and being a good uh, being a good citizen, and I, I just I get very frustrated. I'm sorry, I kind of go on on about that, but it's so important. It's um, well, it is, and and I, you know, once again, I'll go back to being a scientist a little bit. I a lot of um, teachers have told me that the evaluation process, where where uh, you know maybe 50 percent, uh, certainly a, a great chunk of their evaluation is based on how their students do on on these standardized tests. Um, that that if there's no validity to the tests, then how can there be validity to to making the determination about teachers? And then and then there are other things. Um, if if you're a teacher, even if you're the best teacher in the world and you're absent more than four times or five times, kind of depending on the school district, they'll list you as minimally effective. And so you you get branded with this label of being mentally uh, uh, minimally effective. Uh, I spoke with a teacher in, in Rio Doso recently who's been teaching for 20 years, and you could tell she really had that enthusiasm, but she got branded as minimally effective. Oh, God. And, and so uh, it, it was frustrating for her. Uh, and, and so all of this putting labels on people, and especially labels that are based on, on a system that, that doesn't have any validity to, you know, to, to how the tests really score people. Mostly the tests are, are an evaluation of how much poverty there is in your school district. I mean, they, they relate closer to that than almost anything else. Um, just, man, there's just so much frustration out there. So, um, we, we have to have a new, new leadership at the Department of Public Education. Um, we, we have to reach out to educators and say, we want you to come back to us and talk to us about what you think needs to be done to make the schools effective. We can't just chase, um, you know, corporate dollars for race to the top or, uh, or, or these kinds of things. People are very frustrated with the whole Common Core initiative and, and what it does to our schools. And one of the things I really like about New Mexico, having grown up in New Mexico, is occasionally we're willing to stand up and say, you know what, keep your, keep your corporate dollars, keep your federal dollars, we're going to do what we think is best for our kids. 
And if you know, you can go along with us or not, but but we we are you know, we in New Mexico know what's good for our students in New Mexico. We're gonna drive this train and, and that that's not occurring right now because we have a public education secretary who I think is not answering to any uh, particular entity in New Mexico that um, you know that that has um, that desire to help our students in New Mexico. I've been lucky enough to be a teacher for the last thirty years at the university, and I deal with a lot of really wonderful kids who come from New Mexico high schools, and uh, we have a terrible rap, uh, and they've done awful things. The kids who simply do not deserve it. Poverty, as we know, is a Terrible, terrible, terrible thing. I mean, if anybody who's been poor or even, even found themselves without a job for a while knows how wretched and bitter and hard it is. We have, um, suddenly we have a minimum wage. We all know that there are certain kinds of jobs that make a lot of money and there are certain kinds of jobs that simply don't. And part of the, part of the role of government is to try just in some small way to level that inequality. We need a higher minimum wage in New Mexico, I believe it, and I think you do too. What is, um, how do we actually operate that, and how do we get that on a statewide level? Well, there's so many things that we can do to address poverty in New Mexico, but, but number one, one of the most straightforward things is to increase the minimum wage in New Mexico. Um, two years ago now, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> We're glad that it's raining, but it causes allergies. Huh? Yeah, two two years ago, uh, I, th I think it was two years ago, the legislature passed an increase, a a, a, a really modest increase from uh, from a little over seven dollars to a little over eight dollars, uh, and the governor vetoed that. And um, you know, it, uh, my my campaign. Um, uh, partner Deb Holland, who's running for lieutenant governor, uh, has been talking a lot about uh, about the fact that she worked for a bakery many years ago when she was coming up, and that that she made more then than the minimum wage is now, ah. and and she does not understand, and I don't understand how how a, a family uh, who has a couple of children can survive on the minimum wage. I mean, it, it's it, it's it's not appropriate for us to even ask how people can do that because the only way they can do that is by having multiple jobs, essentially. Exactly. Uh, and if they're having multiple jobs, then we have these issues of, of child care and whether they're, you know, uh, how often the parents are gone and the children are left home by themselves and such. So uh, there, there are a lot of these problems that, that could be addressed by uh, by increasing the minimum wage and, and by, by developing a living wage for people in New Mexico. I mean, yes. I, I think that, that we should we should be working towards towards that goal um, but but back to minimum wage for a minute you know that you will hear arguments that say well you know if you, the minimum wage kills jobs but <clears throat> I saw a report about a month ago that said that they had looked at all of the states around the country that had increased the minimum wage and that states that increase the minimum wage by and large have better economies economies that have grown faster than uh, than states where, where there's not been an increase in the minimum wage and so uh, the, the, the fallacy for those people who say that minimum wage, I, I think, kills the economy is that, that they don't think about the fact that somebody who's, who's making uh, money at that level, not very likely to be able to save much of it. I mean, it, whatever money they make is going to go into paying the rent, paying for groceries. Uh, if they make a little extra, maybe they'll go out and have dinner every once in a while. And as I travel around the state, I notice that, that restaurants are not doing very well because in a bad economy, people stop going out to eat. And, and if you don't have a little bit of extra money, then that's one of the first things that you cut out. So, uh, you know, I, I think that our economy would, would be much more vibrant uh, with an increase in the minimum wage, and, and that's one of the reasons that I support it. There's, there's also this very humanitarian reason to say that we, we as, a, as a state should not countenance uh, you know, keeping people at a at a at a poverty level, uh, you know that that goes to actually dealing with poverty in in other ways. I think we have a lot of poverty in rural New Mexico. I was in Mora um, two weeks ago for the Mora parade, and uh, and they said that their school system has gotten down where it's it's very small because young people are not staying in the community. They can't get a job in the community there, and so they have to go elsewhere. And, and New Mexico is also one of the states, one of just a couple of states, that, that have actually lost population over the last two or three years. And that's because we have so many people that have to go out of state to find jobs. Very, very 
disturbing circumstance. But it, but it's it's impacting rural communities in a particularly harsh way. So uh, besides the minimum wage, we have to figure out how to help small business. We have to figure out how to be more innovative. We have to get infrastructure into our smaller communities so that um, that they have good access to the internet. They yes. have good. Um, they have. Uh, you know, I, I think transportation is so important. As I'm driving around the state, and I'm doing a lot of driving around the state, you see how how bad the roads have gotten in New Mexico. And so, you know, there there's so many infrastructure things that we need to do to make New Mexico the kind of place that people want to come uh, and do their business. And we know we have those great things in New Mexico. People love New Mexico for our climate, for our for our art and culture. Um, you know, for uh, it's we just know what a wonderful place it is to live, and so we need to we need to sell that. But but people are are gonna um, look more at that if if they have the infrastructure, you know, where they can come and um, and and make their business work because they have good infrastructure. And and even for tourism, I, my wife and I were talking about this, and I thought it was a a great point. And I I have to mention my wife Yolanda is a she's a PhD chemist. She worked thirty two years for the Department of Defense. She's a really smart person and so when we're driving around the state we, we come up with all these good ideas. But she pointed out that if you're a tourist and you come to New Mexico, um, you know, you want to stay in a hotel that has good Wi Fi so that you can stay in touch with your office yeah. and uh, and so, you know, a lot of rural communities would probably get more tourism if people had just the, the resources that they need to stay in touch with the rest of the world. Because if you're not tied in with the rest of the world now, um, you know, you're uh, people aren't comfortable with you know, with not having access to the internet and, and such and so um, it's it's not just infrastructure for you know for small communities uh, isn't just a nicety anymore it's a it's a necessity. A graphic I think yesterday morning about New Mexico is indeed among a number a small number of states that are dead last in terms of of connectivity uh, on the internet uh, we just don't have enough stuff and we we can even see it in Albuquerque it's hard to you know it's hard to hook on the um, most, um, one of the things that's irked me, and I know a lot of us, is this idea um, that people who um, need food stamps will be required to do some kind of extra work. It's my belief that probably 90% of the people who are on food stamps or 95% of them need it. They already work hard. Many of them are p probably with this minimum wage structure also um, working 80 hours a week. Um, it seems like it's a this is this requirement or this proposed requirement is part of this large propaganda to somehow demonize working people, to demonize local businesses uh, at the expense of huge corporations, uh, uh, which uh, so. Um, how can we, uh, how would you handle the food stamp problem? Well, I think you put your finger on, on part of it by saying that, you know, especially in an election year, this demonization of, of people that are, that might be different. Um, in a lot of different ways. I mean, not not just uh, you know uh, poor working people, uh, immigrants. You know, there there's so many groups that we can talk about where uh, where for political purposes there's a demonization. But I I, I fall back to the uh, the point of view of my mother and father, which is that every human being you know has merit. Every human being is entitled to respect. And uh, and and if we if we write people off. Uh, that that's a that's a horrible mistake for for us as human beings. Um, so with regard to the food stamp program, I, you know I, I think uh, we should always be concerned about waste, fraud, and abuse. I mean that's the the attorney general's office. That's our job is to go out there and find people that are that are doing something fraudulent. But I, you know I have found as I as I go through life that like you said, ninety percent of people, ninety five percent of people are are honest and hardworking and just want to do the right thing for their family. Um, and, and if we if we develop a system, um, you know that in, that encourages um, people to, to work around the system, I, I think that that's you know shame on us in, in a way. So so food stamps were by and large designed to make sure that particularly families with children um, have the nutrition that they need, and all of these things tie together. You know, a child who's hungry is not going to learn well at school. You know, if you go to school with an empty stomach, you're not going to be concerned about mathematics or, or something like that. So, 
Um, you know, th these are programs that we developed to basically say we have a heart in this country. Uh, people that need a little bit of help, we're, we're going to help them with a little bit of help. So I like the idea of making uh, training available, you know, helping people to find jobs that fit their skills. Sure. I mean, all of those kinds of things. Yeah. But, but anything that's just sort of a mandatory across the board, um, you know, you, you have to work if you're going to get food stamps kind of, you know, kind of idea doesn't recognize that every, everybody has a lot of different circumstances. Mm -hmm. And um, and so I, you know, I, I share your concern uh, about having a, a blanket program that just says, eh, you know, uh, yeah. you're, all, you're all a bunch of scofflaws. And, uh, because we do have, uh, you know, it goes back to those statistics. New Mexico has the highest rate of children that go to bed hungry every night. Yeah. Yolanda, uh, uh, New Mexico has the highest rate of, of children who live in poverty. Oh, and, and until we address that, you know, we're, we're going to continue to have that problem. So it, instead of saying we're going to address food stamps by making people work, let's address food stamps by giving people the opportunity um, to increase their education, the opportunity to make a decent living wage. Uh, that you won't have to have food stamps if, you, you know, if we have jobs out there that are the kinds of jobs that help people do yeah. that. So. so as we all know, jobs, 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 the, uh, you know, uh, location, 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 job. It's the, it's the issue. Um, I've always been sort of concerned about what happens when you hollow out public employment to job statistics in New Mexico, when you actually, through attrition or through firing or through overall policy, shrink government so much that you don't have those kind of fundamental public service mm -hmm. jobs. But aside from that, how does one help to stimulate local businesses as opposed to out-of-state businesses? Well, there's so many things that we could be doing. Um, we talked a little bit about the need for good infrastructure, and, yeah, and I sure. think that that's important. Um, tax policy is really important. You know, the, the governor's tax plan and tax package that she passed uh, three years ago now, I suppose, which, which hasn't generated jobs. I mean, so once again, we, we know that it, that it hasn't helped, but here's why I think it hasn't helped. One is that, that offering uh, big tax breaks to out-of-state corporations has not, by and large, brought corporations here to do business. Um, it, actually, we, for instance, Intel, who should have benefited from those tax cuts, has been moving jobs to other states still. And so, um, you know, it's, it, it's just not very smart to not sit down with industries that are in New Mexico already and say, what do you need to help you expand your business in New Mexico? Um, I, don't, I don't think that we've taken that approach. And, and particularly with small business, I, uh, as I talk to people about jobs in New Mexico, I say, if you've got a business that has 10 employees and we help you add a, a, another employee, that's 10% job growth, yes. which, is, which is way bigger than what we have now. But we, um, those big tax cuts uh, foisted on our local governments, on, on counties and municipalities, the need to increase their gross receipts taxes. And gross receipts taxes hit local business. Gross receipts taxes hit, uh, in, indeed, um, you know, families and, and small business and such because if you're a small business in Moriarty, you probably go to the local Staples, you know, to buy your materials. If you're Walmart, you contract on a national basis and you have your paper brought in by the truckload and your pencils brought in by the truckload. And, and so uh, we're, we're not doing enough to stimulate small business in New Mexico. We, we, we really need to do that because that's the basis of our economy. Uh, agriculture. I've been talking to a lot of people as we go around that you know that we need to uh, once again figure out what we're doing in in taxes that 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 cascade onto our small businesses and agriculture. And so so there is there's tax policy involved in that. There's there's infrastructure involved in that. I think for the kinds of small business we want to create in New Mexico, the innovative businesses. Um, you know, solar, solar-based businesses, um, alternative energy, all of those things that New Mexico ought to be good at. Uh, once again, we haven't gone out and reached out and said, what do you need, you know, that would help you in New Mexico? Uh, we had a great film industry in New Mexico, and then partly because of, of the governor uh, playing games with, uh, with the film credit, uh, we, we fell from second as a, as a good place to do your filming to 10th or so. I mean, we're still a place where people want to do that, but it's a good, clean industry. It was providing jobs for a lot of New Mexicans. You know, we, we shouldn't turn our back on those industries that are doing well already, uh, you know, at, at the expense of, of reaching out to, um, to something that may or may not happen. And so uh, I, I just think that a lot more of our policy needs to be focused on helping small business to do better in New Mexico. So we hear... Uh as we read around the West, that uh, there's a move in Arizona to, uh, to start to pay farmers uh, for not using water 
So so it'll bring uh, Lake Mead up a little bit, and we know that um, that indeed probably uh, uh, the city fathers of uh, and mothers of Tucson and Phoenix are thinking about a mega metroplex, and the only way to, between the two cities, and the only way to feed that is by doing away with agriculture. Um, in New Mexico, so much of our rural business and so much of our of our family life is wrapped up in land and land usage and ranching and agriculture. I've always been so nervous about this this war between cities and agriculture over water. I think it's a basically a bogus war myself. But I, I don't know. but so what does what does one do now in um, when we see Texas beginning to maraud for our water when we hear about California and Arizona and Nevada starting to work on a plan to redo the Colorado Compact, which would be like, in my judgment, like redoing the Constitution. Uh, what do we, what do we do about water in New Mexico? I know that our water plan is using data that's that's uh, four years old. I know uh, there's not much confidence in the state engineer. This is a big, huge problem, and it's not going to go away. We have t we have big groundwater problems from the Kirtland spill. We may be actually required to go back and use our aquifer in Albuquerque. It's a, it's a, it's a terrible thing just to be sort of sitting on it and not doing anything about it. Well, well, first off, you put your finger on it again. Water is is our most precious resource in New Mexico, and so uh, we've been battling with the with the governor over uh, something called the copper rule, where they where they want to allow uh, big open pit mines to inject polluted water into the groundwater, uh, essentially claiming as long as you keep it within the the boundaries of the of the mine, that somehow or another that's okay. But it, I mean, it doesn't recognize the scientific truth that that groundwater moves. Yeah. You, you mentioned the the Kirtland spill, which yeah. I mean that occurred a long time ago, and and we. But we need to be more aggressive at, at addressing that. Uh, we need to make sure that that polluted water doesn't doesn't reach the well fields because because indeed once our groundwater is polluted, that that's the great majority of our drinking water in New Mexico is groundwater. So so we have to be concerned about that. Um, with regard to the rivers, though, uh, for instance, my office is, is involved now in a big uh, lawsuit that's become Texas versus New Mexico, right. where uh, where Texas is is claiming that they should get more water. Uh, out of the Rio Grande than the compact allows them to essentially and and our argument is that we have a compact um, there there was uh, what was called an operating agreement between the the two groups of farmers down there where the, where the farmers actually got happy with how they were allocating the water amongst each other but it was depleting the aquifer at a much higher system, a much higher rate than I thought was sustainable and so so we brought suit against the Bureau of Reclamation for releasing water that was New Mexico water to let it go downstream to Texas. Um, we're, I'm, I'm glad that we did that. I think it was the appropriate thing to do. Uh, we should not let our water go without a fight. <laughs> and so, you know, we're going to continue to fight that. And we have really good, strong legal uh, rationales for, for what we're doing there. So so that's really important. But but then it goes to planning, which is the, the important thing you were talking about. When I was in the legislature, we worked to develop a statewide water plan. Um, and now we can't just have a plan and, and then ignore it. We have to know what that means. I think we can have agriculture in New Mexico and development of our you know industrial base and, and our cities because um, agriculture uses a lot of water. And so it, we don't have to use all of the agricultural water to support the cities. Um, if, if we do everything that we can to encourage um, conservation of water by agriculture, and, and I carried a bill in the legislature that would have given tax breaks to agriculture for, for moving to more um, conservative uh, water use systems like drip irrigation and, and certain things that you can do with sprinklers and all those kinds of things that use less water. So it's that conserved water that actually will help us, I think, to, to keep our urban areas going. And then uh, we're working with a variety of groups that are saying, hey, what about making sure that we keep water in the river for the ecosystem because that's that's so important. And and you don't have to take it away from somebody to do it. There are there are farmers who probably would lease their water back to use it in the to, in the river for uh, and and so they they could gain. There are people that will pay for that. That you know they, they everybody could gain from that. I mean, um, um, sportsmen might like to keep more water in the river or 
or like I said, just the the ecosystem. A lot of people would would pay to keep the bosky healthy. I mean, you know, you know, there's there's all these things we can do, but we need to work together once again to to make sure that we're doing that. So a lot of focus on water. If if, if I'm the governor, um, you know, we'll make sure that the state engineer's office is cognizant of all of that. That it's not just directed towards one one business or one industry. I think um, we were talking about a, a, a case earlier on where there's uh, where there's a difference uh, where where downstream senior water rights users are complaining that that the junior users are, are overusing their water. We we should address those issues yes, and make do. sure that we do apply our law so you know so that it fairly treats those people that have the senior water rights. But but people that have senior water rights, you know, um, uh, they. Uh, I think when when there's economic viability to changing the use of that, uh, they will do that. And so you know we need to to foster the ability of people to uh, to use their water rights in in the way that's that, that's uh, that generates good good economics and good environmental concerns and all those things. So we can do that. As you know, we have a uh, a kind of an almost internationally known problem here now with lots of people writing about us in very negative ways because of. Our treatment of homeless people, uh, the Justice Department report, which scathing uh, indictment of Albuquerque Police Department in, in the last uh, since <coughs> since Mayor Barry took office in um, uh, December 2009, and we're also seeing now articles in the New York Times, which really don't do a lot of good for anybody's business in New Mexico, uh, and it's not because. This is not an economic issue, these violence problems. These are humanitarian issues, but uh, humanitarian issues uh, somehow bleed into the rest of our, of our consciousness and our way of life. Uh, we also see uh, that uh, there's a, a dual message being sent now uh, uh, from the city about the Justice Department's report. Uh, one side says we're going to cooperate, and the other side said it's a, it's a bunch of bunk. Jeff Proctor of... Uh, KRQE TV did a wonderful uh, uh, report last last night. So, what can we do to one? What can a governor do to sp speed up this process, to clean up this mess, to get something done, to stop the murders, to stop this awful violence in our town, which is not all we are by any means, but it's there and it's real and it's horrifying. Well, as usual with with difficult problems, I think that there are lots of parts to the solution. Yeah. Um, we are, I, I, a lot of people have expressed to me as Attorney General their, their concern over the training regimen that, you know, that our young officers get and, and that they are not getting nearly enough training on how to de-escalate situations when they get into them. Um, you know, we have a lot of technology. Sometimes technology uh, overcomes uh, our, our ability to think. <laughs> uh, you, know, if, um, you, know, you know, a lot of people have been concerned about, well, as we get to where we have uh, more lethal ways of dealing with problems, that, that, we, that we employ those instead of uh, so, sometimes the best solution might be to just sit and wait. Yes. Um, yes. You know, and, and I think that in, in a few of the situations that I've seen, that, that it might have been better for everybody to, to, to stand back and, and take a little time. So there, there, are, there are management issues there, I think. I, I think individual police officers are faced with very difficult decisions every day. And, um, and we need to, the, to do the best to give them the tools that they need to, to deal with that. And, and so I, that, that's one part of the question. Um, the, I think that when the administration of the city um, once again denies that there even is a problem, that you, you can't fix a problem if you deny that there's a problem. You, you have to admit that, that there's a problem. So one of the things that's been disconcerting to me is, is, is when we had uh, what I think is probably more than, um, certainly more than the national average of police-involved shootings over the course of a, of a couple of years, uh, somebody really needed to sit down and say, hey, what can we do about this? And, and I was, a few years ago, I, I had meetings with the new police chief in Vancouver. They had a lot of problems. I think not so much shooting, but, but a lot of violence problems with their police. They brought in a new police chief who, who had a totally different idea about how a police agency should be run, working much more with the community and, and such. And so, so, for instance, in Albuquerque, I think we would benefit by having just a total change in philosophy about what policing means uh, in Albuquerque. And, and, and I think that a lot of our line police officers would actually appreciate that. I, you know, once again, I don't, I, don't, I don't think that this is systemic with every policeman in, in Albuquerque or in New Mexico. I, I think that... Um, that, that, that those officers need the tools that they need. But the community needs to feel like they have input. 
And, and I, for the longest time, I think they didn't feel like that. And now with the Department of Justice coming in and saying, here are the problems, and I've, I've read that report, and they're very specific about the issues and the problems. So I'm with you on that, that, uh, that, that if we ignore the recommendations of the Department of Justice, if the city of Albuquerque ignores the recommendations of the Department of Justice, then they're just cruising for more problems. I mean, they, they really should sit down with that and say, okay, what can we do to address these concerns? And so a, a governor, I think, could actually sit down with the leadership in the city and say, you know, we, you know, we're, we are going to watch you and we're, you know, we're going to do everything that we can from the state level. And there's, you know, the city depends on um, a lot of cooperation from the state to make, to make various things happen. Right. You know, let's sit down and, and really come up with a plan on how we're going to deal with this. Cause it does, uh, it is a detriment to business in New Mexico and to bringing business to New Mexico for us to have a bad reputation with regard to our public safety. Um, people want to feel safe and comfortable. CEOs, if they want to bring their families to New Mexico and bring uh, their companies to New Mexico and such, want to, want to feel importantly like they have good fire protection, good police protection, all of those things. So we, so we do all have to work together. Um, and I think, uh, you know, obviously, in, in the long run, the buck stops with the mayor with regard to the Albuquerque Police Department. Uh, but, but I think a governor who would sit down with the mayor and say, hey, what's going on here, could make a lot of difference. Well, I'd like to be able to talk for another hour, but uh, I know you're busy and we got to get back to our deadlines. And It's been a great joy to have you here with us and uh, we wish you well and we hope we can talk again perhaps a little closer to the election if that would be possible. Thank you. I'm I'm always happy to to come back, and I you know I, I have the greatest of hopes that that uh, that I can be the governor and come back, and we can talk about not sort of what potential solutions are, but to sit down and talk about how we're changing New Mexico um, to really make it the kind of place that we know it can be. I mean, you know, we we both love New Mexico. We know that that your um, that your viewing audience you know knows that New Mexico can be a fabulous place, and so we just have to roll up our sleeves and make it happen. <laughs>